Today we're gonna talk about the work of black self-taught and outsider artists. I'm gonna walk around the galleries, I'm gonna show you some great examples of work by artists that were uh, drawing from their experiences, they were making work with materials they had on hand, uh, and their stories really tell us a little bit about the formation of this country and also the unique experience of African Americans in the formation of the United States. Uh, and with that, you know, we're gonna start with the artist Bill Trailer. Trailer is someone who has really broken into the mainstream and he's widely collected by museums, American art museums. Because of how important his work is when you think about uh, all of the different uh, parts of history that he was he was able to experience. So Bill Trailer is someone who was born into slavery and throughout his life uh, he was emancipated, you know, and freed. Uh, the 13th Amendment was ratified when he was a young, young adolescent boy. And um, even through emancipation, his family and himself worked on a farm, did subsistence farming like many other freed slaves, and, you know, continued to live in the South. He eventually ended up living in Montgomery in Alabama, and he was houseless um, towards the end of his life. He had many children and he could have migrated like many other, uh, many other people at the time, and he did, you know, he visited daughters, he, he tried to migrate, uh, but he always returned. Uh, during his time um, later in his life, uh, he began to draw, he began to create and start telling some of the stories that uh, he had with him throughout you know, all of this change in his life. Uh, what we have here are three really wonderful examples of the type of uh, stories and the types of symbols that you'll see in Trailer's work. Uh, for example, up here we have a drawing of a chase. You know, you have the characters that will show up repeatedly in his work, which is this person, perhaps a landowner, perhaps a boss, um, with a dog chasing after someone who has taken things, um, a thief. You'll also have symbols of the dog. As I said, it, it shows up here. Um, and you know, the dog is, is a type of menacing figure. Oftentimes when um, enslaved people would try to run away, dogs would be sent after them in order to capture them um, and also punish them. So, you know, the symbol of a dog really takes on a particular meaning when you're looking at it um, through Bill Trailer's eyes. And, and this is uh, uh, kind of a really wonderful detail here of the dog bearing its mouth uh, and you have kind of the ripped paper edge here, this ripped cardboard. Uh, if you look at this example over here, uh, I will say that this is one of my favorite trailers that we have currently out because of how modern it feels. So he was making work in the 1940s and into the early 1950s uh, and here he uses the space of this piece of cardboard with just the most like minimal and graphic shapes you know you have this brown circle this blue circle and this type of um, rhombus down here which is this red and this simple line across um, I believe that this is a representation of a fountain, you know, that he would often see in the city. So he is representing something, but he's really stripped away um, at a lot of the details and only really giving us the colors and the silhouette, um, which really gives it this very graphic and very modern quality. 
Uh, the quality of the materials here is something that is also very alluring to me and, and, and really brings me in because uh, they're very simple materials. They can be crayon, they're pencil. Uh, these drawings are made on the backs of discarded cardboard. Um, he used to work um, in front of a store, a convenience store. Uh, so, you know, he would have widely available pieces of cardboard and he would just sit there and, you know, all of these drawings would come out of him um, and he would sell them. Um, people would notice him and people would know him as, as that person who was drawing. What's ultimately so wonderful about Trailer's work is that the drawings are so inviting. The drawings are at this human scale. You can come up to any of these drawings and you can see uh, the different figures. You can start imagining the stories that are contained within them. And uh, Trailer uses, you know, these pieces of cardboard and the space he has within them uh, as a way to just put you into this very imaginative world. Uh, and it's one that, you know, I find myself returning to over and over again. The next artist we're going to look at was someone who had a very specific community that he was making work for and he considered himself someone who chronicled the history and the goings-on of his community. So I'm really excited to show you the work of Sam Doyle. I'm standing in front of two really big paintings by the artist Sam Doyle and it's kind of curious that they're framed and hung this way because Sam himself uh, didn't necessarily have them displayed this way when he made them. So Doyle is an artist uh, who grew up in the island off the coast of South Carolina called St. Helena. And on this island, the predominant culture is the Gula culture, which is heavily influenced from West Africa. And in this community, which is primarily, primarily African American, um, around the time when Doyle was uh, alive and making work, uh, there were different goings on and different community news and uh, different uh, people doing really remarkable, remarkable things. And Doyle was someone who would chronicle the goings on of the island. So often in his paintings, what you'll have are people who maybe did something notable uh, in the community. Like for example, here you have the first black midwife and you have uh, those words written up top of there and you have the portrait uh, of this woman um, with a baby. Uh, and then here we have an example of uh, this very, uh, you know, tense moment of where you're going to have this basketball player dunk uh, the ball into the net and you have uh, these two other players over here trying to block them. So it's like an action shot, you know, reminds me of maybe seeing the picture of the basketball game uh, on a newspaper, for example. And here, you know, perhaps the story is that there was like a basketball game that was really important. Um, and at the time, this was like one of the great moments that happened at the basketball game and, and Doyle wanted to, to show that and to share that. Uh, with people um, in the community at large. He would paint these on uh, uh, pieces of uh, tin roofing. And, you know, I can't really touch these or, or show you <laughs> um, how they move or feel, but I can describe that the surface of these is very irregular. Uh, so it's a metal surface and at the edges they'll be bent and some of the paint is starting to peel off because of um, the way that it's bent. Uh, the paint he would use would be um, enamel paint or house paint that he would find. 
uh, sometimes these would be on uh, wood so he um, used other materials that you know were easily accessible or that were discarded by other people uh, sometimes he would put two of them together like here you have this line here where he just needed a bigger surface to um, share with us uh, this scene and at first he would show them on his front yard by his house so you would come in and you would see all of these different uh, whether it was portraits of uh, you know exceptional uh, people in his community or exceptional celebrities black celebrities or black businessmen um, these people that um, he felt proud of um, and to preserve that legacy um, you would see it um, there depicted uh, at his home uh, and eventually he had this uh, St. Helena outdoor gallery where they would be you know just kind of some of them would be like dug into the floor or to, into the dirt rather uh, and people could walk by and see them and purchase them um, of course one of the things I wonder about when I look at these works is, you know, who are the people in these portraits? Who are the uh, basketball players playing this really exciting game? Uh, how much can we know about them? Since Doyle was making these paintings, you know, to share information, to share these, you know, exciting or really good moments, or sometimes to spread gossip, uh, the community that saw them, you know, had all that backstory, you know, perhaps they knew the first black midwife, perhaps they knew the basketball player, so they had all this context for uh, the painting. So, you know, as someone like myself or, you know, someone like you who's watching this, you know, I do wonder, like, what are we missing here? Like, what are the pieces of information that we don't have? Uh, so the pieces of information that we do have almost become um, so important and so precious, right? Like we can start reading up on who was the first black midwife. We can start reading up on, you know, what kinds of basketball games or what kind of basketball teams there were in St. Helena. But, you know, we are still left wondering, oh, what, what do the people who saw these know that perhaps we don't know now. The next artist we're looking at is Joseph Yoakum. These are two of his drawings that we have currently uh, in our galleries. Yoakum's work is so fascinating because uh, he was an artist who traveled in the circus and he created a whole uh, story for himself about his travels, his adventures, where he's been. Uh, he began traveling when he was a teenager and into his adult life he joined the military and then he started a business with uh, his wife, uh, eventually uh, ending up here in Chicago um, and living in a storefront um, on the south side. One way to look at the drawings of Joseph Yoakum is as if it's as if they're windows. And these windows that we have here are landscapes. Uh, we have two of them here in particular, one which is really dominated by these blues and purples and this one down here, which has more greens and yellows. Um, and I love that they're um, hung this way because you can compare and contrast um, some of the colors that Yoakum would use. Yoakum was very particular about where these landscapes were. Um, so you'll see the names um, usually in the drawings, like this is the Persimmon Valley, this is the highest point of Kansas State. However, they may not necessarily exactly be those places. Uh, perhaps they're more imagined spaces. Now, here's what I mean by that. Uh, Yoakum did say that he was depicting, you know, these real landscapes. Uh, and at the same time, he was someone who had uh, a vast array of encyclopedias, of atlases, of maps. So he was a researcher. He knew these places. He, 
he had seen them um, through National Geographic, for example. Uh, so these places were uh, uh, full of details that he might have seen or researched, absolutely. Um, whether they're, you know, the exact replica of that place is still something that we have questions around. Um, however, uh, what I do want to draw attention to is just how he leads our eyes through the journey of the landscape. So for example, here we have this path or this road that leads us all across the drawing. Uh, what we have up here are these mountains that draw our eye um, up and down the surface of the paper. And as you get close, you also start to see how delicately he drew uh, all the texture um, of the drawing, but also the texture of the mountains. Uh, in fact, here where you see the grass um, going up into this hill, uh, it really, really makes me think of perhaps like a topography map or a cross section of a map where you can see the different layers uh, that you know go into, for example, the surface of the earth or the different um, soil layers. Um, but here you have them in these greens uh, that go upwards in this way. Uh, of course, you have these very, very vivid skies, these, these blues up here. And up here you also have a vivid blue, but then you have these menacing clouds. Uh, so the, these windows that Joachim has are imaginative. They come from a place of research. They come from a place of knowing what these landscapes are and perhaps how they feel. Um, and yet we're left with questions of, is this really the highest point in Kansas City? Is this really the Persimmon Valley? Um, and that's uh, something that, you know, each viewer brings um, as they're looking at the work. The last artist I want to show you is Inez Nathaniel Walker. She was an African-American woman who uh, lived and worked in New York State. Uh, she migrated from South Carolina uh, up north in the 1930s, as so many uh, black Southerners did. Uh, in fact, uh, they were so integral to the formation of cities in the Midwest and cities up north uh, called the Great Migration. So during this time, uh, Inez Nathaniel Walker uh, unfortunately was imprisoned uh, due to a homicide out of self-defense. It was while she was imprisoned in the uh, early 70s when she began to draw and she began to make art. Um, it was a way for her to be occupied. It was a way, you know, to be out of trouble while she was incarcerated. Uh, one of her teachers, her English teacher, was the first one to notice, you know, this pile of drawings that she had, uh, this pile of portraits that uh, Walker had made. So uh, I want to focus on these two uh, portraits that we have here because they show some wonderful details that you'll often see in Walker's portraits. Uh, you have the wonderful use of pattern. So you have pattern in the backgrounds here. So in the background of these portraits, you have these kind of uh, geographic uh, patternings. Uh, they're in pen, they're in pencil, colored pencil. You also get the patterning and this repetition in the hair. So here we have uh, two African-American uh, people being portrayed. So you have um, this, the texture of the hair of the Afro. Um, and here it's this uh, brown color that's framing the face. Uh, and you get this wonderful framing of the hair um, right at the eyes. And I'll come back to the eyes. And here you have this um, uh, man with an afro that's uh, drawn with pencil, kind of these kind of squiggly pencil lines. And you see the sideburns, you see the goatee. Uh, and also this eye that's almost like magnified, even though he's on a side profile, you get these deep eyes with the 
uh, circle uh, of eyelashes, which is uh, one of Walker's signatures, these eyelashes that go around the eye. Now, as you look at the eyes, you uh, can start to kind of get lost in them. You know, they're so big, they are framed by the hair, they're framed by the eyebrows. Uh, and it's something you see in, in Walker's portraits the more that you look at them. One other detail which is really fun, um, and I always like to really ponder this um, as I look at the portrait, is the style that you see uh, in these sitters. So here you have a woman with a short shirt or a dress um, that has these patterns which are kind of like half circles um, or waves um, across her shoulders, across her chest. And you also see this tiny um, fabric edge here uh, that you see all around and it's uh, drawn in with red. So you get a little ribbon um, tie and you get all of this really nice edging here. So you get a sense of the texture of what this person is wearing. And here you have someone that is highly accessorized. You have this tie here, maybe a bolo tie. These portraits were made in the late 70s. Uh, someone who has many, many buttons. You know, it makes me imagine like what material the buttons are made out of. And you also have this belt down here with all of these details that um, Walker shows us the different little um, metal portions and perhaps a leather that has its own pattern. Uh, so while we may not know who they are, whether Walker uh, knew these people, um, she put a lot of details into these portraits to show us that this is a particular person and this is a person with their own personality, sense of style, and it, it really draws us in to uh, who this person uh, may have been. Thank you so much for joining me as I walk around the museum and introduce you to so many different works of art. I encourage you to continue to follow us as we make videos focusing on single artists or on different themes. Uh, thank you so much.